free to get yourself a coffee or test our chat. We should be getting started today at about 3 p.m. So for those of you who are here early, thank you so much. If you can help me out with a sound check, feel free to shoot me a text if you know me or use the chat. Appreciate it. We'll be getting started officially at 3 p.m. If you do like the beats, this is from my great friend from Oakland, Drake Tech 20, D R E T E K 20. I'm using this with his permission, of course. Uh, you can find it on Spotify. He's produced a lot of songs, a lot of good beats, instrumentals, some rap, some hip hop. Love uh, lifting up my friends. Again, thanks for those of you who are here on time. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. If you like, please test our chat and engage. We love questions. So at 3 p.m. we'll be on with Steven Skinner. Steven Skinner is an awesome, awesome uh, leader in the real estate tech industry. He's been in the industry for many, many years. Former CIO for Alain Pinnell and for First Team, two of California's largest independent real estate brands. And I'm thrilled to have this conversation with him. So we're going to get started here at about 3 p.m. Again, thanks for your patience. Welcome, welcome to the Groundbreaker series. This is your host, Pierre Calzadilla. We'll be getting started here in just a few moments. In the meantime, please feel free to get yourself a coffee or test our chat. We should be getting started today at about 3 p.m. So for those of you who are here early, thank you so much. If you can help me out with a sound check, feel free to shoot me a text if you know me or use the chat. Appreciate it. We'll be getting started officially at 3 p.m. If you do like the beats, this is from my great friend from Oakland, Drake Tech 20. D-R-E-T-E-K 20. I'm using this with his permission, of course. Uh, you can find it on Spotify. He's produced a lot of songs, a lot of good beats, instrumentals, some rap, some hip hop. Love uh, lifting up my friends. Again, thanks for those of you who are here on time. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. If you like, please test our chat and engage. We love questions. All right, folks, we are now live. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear us. I'm going to just uh, check in and make sure that uh, the gang's all there. On Wednesday, if you're here again and you were here on you know, Wednesday and it did not work, uh, or you, you, know, you just saw a bunch of dudes smiling and laughing with no audio, I wasn't putting you on. That was an accident, was a, but a lesson learned. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, everyone, who came back today. And we'll be back on our regular schedule next week on uh, Wednesdays. So here we are with uh, Agent Skinner. Uh, real name, Stephen Skinner, a uh, great friend of mine. How you doing, Stephen? Good, good, good. My Canadian friend. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hello might... to our listening audience. <laughs> I might be in Montreal, but I'm still American. Although I will tell you, I got my Quebec license this week. Uh, so see? it was That's the most, I had to turn in my California license. So it was oh. legitimate, like legitimate moment of like, oh, wow. Like the only thing left is a passport. So, so, well, I am so coming to you live from beautiful downtown San Diego. That's right. That's right. So, uh, for the folks, my squeaky chair. For the folks that are, and I'm just checking my text one time just to make sure. Great sound is perfect. Awesome. Thank you, family. Thank you, friends. Um, so, I'm just, uh, you know, let's kick this off. So, Groundbreaker series. What is this about? In case you're a first time uh, viewer, Groundbreaker series is going to focus on the people, the tech, and the built world like projects that really move the real estate industry. We are streaming live right now on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. 
uh, the recordings will be repurposed. You're gonna see these on podcasts, on some other other stuff, and we'll chop up some questions and answers. Uh, so please engage. Um, I do have a chat option here. So if you uh, want to chat with us, we can see you definitely off of Facebook. It's working really well. So if you go to Facebook on Local Logic, if you're on YouTube or you're on Twitter and you can't engage, uh, find Local Logic on Facebook and you can ask us questions. And so let's kick this off. So uh, Stephen Skinner, out of San Diego. Stephen's been at the at the intersection of technology, advanced technology, information design, real estate for his whole career. Um, we're going to start with where his career started, which is in movies. I, I'm, and I love to, I love to hear the story. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear it already, Stephen, so I can All be right. shocked and okay. odd. <laughs> um, I'll pretend I didn't tell you. Yeah. Great. Great. Perfect. Perfect. So, you know, you know how, let, 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 let's start there. How did you a get into 3d movie work and, and Hollywood? And then the follow-up question, which we'll get to in a, in a little bit, I, I will ask you will be how that transitions into, into real estate. So how'd you get into this? Like, how'd you start yep. doing 3d movies? Yep. Great question. So I'm a native Californian, uh, grew up in Los Angeles. So, you know, kind of always around Hollywood stuff there. But um, I I went to college, I graduated from Berkeley with an architecture degree, thinking I was going to save the world, you know, one building at a time. Uh, And, but this was in, um, I graduated in 81, back in the 20th century. And I discovered, uh, I walked by a computer store in San Francisco and I saw an Apple II computer doing 3D computer graphics. And, and I was like, I, I want that. That was like heroin to me. It was like, it was like science fiction, you know, heroin. I wanted to do that, but I couldn't figure out how at that time. So, so I bought an Apple computer. I taught myself the fundamentals of 3D computer graphics, how to build models. And I got a job um, at a studio, a startup, large startup called Digital Productions, uh, literally building spaceships for the feature film, The Last Starfighter. And that was the first, uh, that was the, this was really oh, wow. the, the dawning of, and that's what some of these pictures are back here, Tron and Last Starfighter. Tron was before my time, but right after Tron, um, the company was founded by John Whitney Jr. and Gary Demos to do what they called photorealistic uh, uh, digital scene simulation. That was the term. And the company was called Digital Productions. And the engine that was going to you know, render all of this 20 plus minutes of, of uh, high resolution uh, computer graphics was uh, a Cray XMP supercomputer. And now, so, and I just for a second here, yeah, the, so like the Cray how. X, I like XMP, how I saw a photo of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> like how much processing power did a Cray XMP have and how big was it? Well, it was, it was like working in Hoover Dam. I mean, the amazing thing was like, this was not, you know, at that time, these computers cost, uh, Cray still makes supercomputers. They cost around $12 million in 1980 uh, to have, Jeez. you know, the, the world's fastest computer that was probably less powerful than your average cell phone today. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> what was amazing about it is this is, you know, these computers were used in, um, uh, you know, in government, nuclear weapons design. Uh, there weren't a lot of them around. And um, because they were was such a, such a specialized piece of equipment, um, uh, if you've ever seen one, they're round. Uh, all the circuit boards are copper and they're so dense that they generate a tremendous amount of heat. And then under the floor, uh, you have a, a cooling system filled with Freon. And literally, this computer had its own generator because um, it ran on DC power. And it had Jeez a cooling least. tower to get rid of the heat, you know, like a cooling tower like you'd find on top of a big building. Wow. So there was a staff that actually had to had to operate the computer and keep it running because it ran 24 hours a day. You know, it's so expensive that you you needed to feed this thing stuff to do. And when we weren't doing um, uh, visual effects, then we would do um, scientific visualization because the the same company was also a National Science Foundation supercomputer facility. Wow. So so let me ask you a question. I got lucky. So, so you got this supercomputer experience. You're making movies in Hollywood. You are probably making a little bit of 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 coin. I imagine. Did did you start going in like like how did that transition into into real estate? Like what 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 called yeah. you over into real estate from making you know movies in Hollywood? 
Thank you. So I did that for a couple of decades, um, had a chance to work overseas. It, it paid better than architecture, which is notoriously low paying. And I ended up in, because my specialty was modeling, three-dimensional modeling, um, I ended up in, in, in the Valley, in Silicon Valley in 98, working at a Stanford uh, spinoff startup that had developed technology for uh, automatically creating surface models from scan data. And I would, you know, and again, very fortunate to, you know, be able to do things that I liked doing and inspired me. But after the dot-com bubble imploded um, and 9-11 happened, I had to take a year off. I took a, it was my unplanned sabbatical. Hmm. I got to spend it with my kids, which was great. Um, but it was clear that work for me and my 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 chosen field of computer graphics was not coming back. That that's not enough. So I I became a realtor. Um, I fizzboed my own house. That taught me a lot. I successfully oh. fizzboed my own house where, in where, LA. Where was where was that first house? Was it was it in Silicon Valley? That was or in, in LA? Glendale. I had a beautiful Spanish style house. I I um I built a sign that looked like just like you know it should. I scraped every top agent's email address off of any website I could find. And <laughs> I, and I, and I sent them an electronic flyer and they had never, this was 1982. And they were like, who is this guy? But, uh, but they didn't want to sell my house because I was a FISBO. They right, wanted right. me to come work for them. So I became a realtor. I um, moved back to the Bay That's area and ended up at APR and eventually ended up in their tech on their tech team. I, I, I have a very similar story. Like, you know, 9-11 happened. I was in New York selling tech. One of my yeah. accounts was uh, uh, UBS. And, uh, I, and you know, they were hit pretty hard. Obviously, all of New York City was, 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 was hit, you know, the financial market. And so I was selling tech and I was like, well, th there's no tech being sold in New York right now. And so uh, I ended up going into real estate. And uh, same thing, like, you know, 2000 and... Ended up uh, 2001. Ended up, um, you know, being like tech savvy and applying tech to real estate. Ended up becoming a director of your business for for a brokerage in uh, in, yeah. in in New York. It's like the right time. Like the industry was yeah. like in this moment of like busting open. And so, so you've worked at Alon Pinnell and First Team. But before we go into some of the problems that those companies face, for for those yeah. people who who don't know the names, because we have folks from across the industry, we have consumers watching. Can you give us uh, a bit of a sense of scale of Alain Pinnell and First Team? Yeah, thanks, Pierre. Um, absolutely. So Alain Pinnell, uh, now part of uh, Compass, acquired a year or two ago, um, was um, the number five uh, highest dollar volume uh, uh, private brokerage in the U.S., despite the fact that they were only um, 1,400 agents. So they were very successful private firm um, with a big footprint in luxury all around the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, First Team is a very similar firm without, without the same uh, you know, uh, focus exclusively on luxury and the same productivity numbers. But when I left Alain Pinnell seven years ago, they were doing around $11 billion in sales volume with 1,400 agents, which is a, that's a pretty high number. Got it. Yeah, no, no, no. Like Alain Pinnell, I mean, I remember prior to their acquisition by prior to their acquisition by Compass, I think they were the number three uh, yeah. brokerage in the country on sales volume. So yeah, no, like and Bay Area home market. prices have something to do with that as well. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, nothing like having a right price market. Said <laughs> the guy who can't afford to live up there anymore. Yeah, that's it. So 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 having worked at, at these large brands with you know selling really some of the most expensive real estate in the country. What are some of the problems that a brokerage like that faces that maybe people aren't, aren't, aren't aware of? Like, like what are some of the things that, that you dealt with while you were there? Yeah, I think I, it's a great question. I think um, one of the big challenges is just, you know, the difference between running a business operation, you know, in the back office and, uh, and what happens in the front office, you know, with your agent, uh, you know, with how you're providing uh, tools and applications to your agents. The, the needs are, are different, right? And, and agents being so independent 
uh, often want to do things their own way, which is fine. Mm. Um, I, I could never figure out the connection. Like I started working in Hollywood. How did I end up in real estate? But then I realized you've got egos and money, you know, and time <laughs> pressure <laughs> and drama. And, I, and once I figured that out, I was like, okay. I, it's just like, just like Hollywood. The, well, you have very strong personalities in both industries. And if you right. piss off the wrong person, it could really hurt your career. Totally. Uh, it's just like Hollywood. Man, this is 100% true. Uh, yeah. 100% true. Uh, and so, and so, you know, t- top brokerages have to deal with adoption issues, tech issues. I mean, you know, as a, as a CTO of, of, of these kinds of companies, a CIO of these kinds of companies, whichever, you know, they're very similar roles actually. So like, depending on how the company structures it, what, you, you know, what, what did you see are some like the biggest concerns down on the tech side, these, cause you know, actually side note on this, like, well, as I, you know, as I, as I see the industry for a second, like th- there, there are, there's a lot of co- uh, uh, consolidation happening right now. Mm-hmm which is actually creating more of these mega mega firms and mega companies, which is why I think this question is important because as these companies start to come together and people start to blend in brands, you know, they, these create a lot of other issues. So maybe can you talk a little bit about, you know, yeah. that, that problem as well as yeah. the problem of, uh, of scale? Absolutely. So, you know, technology has always been important to the real estate brand, uh, no more so than in Alain Pinel, which was literally one of the first brokers to put computers on every agent's desks. They actually hmm. uh, worked with Steve Jobs. They bought 500 Next computers no and turned, way. Them, turned them into real estate workstations. But, but, and so their brand was all about technology. But once I got there and kind of looked at it from the point of view of a tech person, I realized, well, there's a lot of work to do. So technology is a big part of real estate identity and branding for brokers today. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also a big part of how the brokerage operations run. And historically, uh, you know, IT was always viewed as something expensive where you need to reduce costs. And that that creates kind of a tension between like, well, if this is such an important thing for our brand and maybe even a centerpiece of our, you know, of how we recruit and retain, you know, what does that really mean? So. So, you know, a lot of sort of opposing forces financially within a brokerage around Mm -hmm. what to spend money on marketing or tech or MarTech. Um, You know, I don't know if it's good or bad that those words ever got mashed together. Well, that's exactly Um, the point I I was going to bring up is that what happened was like, I remember this, right? Because I went through the same, right? So like I I start this, you know, director of e-business, an unknown title. Like, what the heck does e-business mean? I've had a lot of those. In, in 2001, it was like, what are you doing? Like, who's this e-business person? And because there was nothing else to like, you know, because I wasn't the, like, people still asked me to f- fix their computers. So I still would go to offices and plug in Ethernet cables and set up printer drivers. But my real job was shifting, you know, $30,000 of print advertising to digital and getting leads and, and top funnel. But there was this, like, this moment of, like, tech became marketing that everybody sort of lit, had to had to live through, and then it, it was totally seen as a cost, as a cost and a pain to have to pay for this te- this hardware. But when that same budget became your digital marketing budget, which really, which is how these brokerages transitioned, to, like like the tech team, from my experience, and and tell me from yours, like was the one who sort of led to go online and to go digital, where the marketing team sometimes was focused on print still. Like was that your experience? Or was it different? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, if you're in marketing, you know, you, and you want to get out of print, you're going to have to explain to a lot of sales managers and top agents why you're not in their local newspaper anymore. Right. Right. And that argument, that, that discussion is still going on, you know, 10 or 15 years later. Right. Uh, thing, thing that I've often said to myself is like, I've worked for a couple of big legacy brokers. And the reality is if you were starting a brokerage today from the ground up, like a, a side or a a compass, you know, you would do it exactly more or less the way they're doing it. Right. Um, But if you're a legacy broker, you know, that's been around for a number of decades and many of these firms are, you know, 20 to 40 years old, you have this uh, existing business momentum. That's really hard to like pivot and redefine. hundred percent. And that's not that's as true about people as it is about processes or or 
or technology. 100%. I, I, actually, COVID, you know, just some context here. Uh, on our last uh, Groundbreaker, not to plug it, but the, but the last Groundbreaker series, we had five five brokers on. And one of the things that they that they talked about was how, like, they're, re- they're using COVID. Oh, not that they're using it, but it became a really great lever to rethink their office space and to rethink, like, why do we have an office? What's the purpose of the office? And, and to shed some of this legacy. And because a lot of these agents, because of COVID, have had to go on Zooms daily, have had to go and do these kinds of things that now force them to adopt technology that they were resistant to. For like, imagine, like, I remember trying to do company all hands remote and people were like, no. And right. now it became like, you're going to be remote, you know? And, and so, but that's allowed now. I think brokerage is going to experience a resurgence or be a really big move um to this digital age and covid is going to be a forcing function of that uh which brings me to my next question which is now there's a lot of tech out there how does a brokerage not make like like what are the big mistakes that these brokerages make when they go and pick tech and they buy tech like are they are they are, are they using the wrong uh, uh uh like well how can i phrase this uh not the wrong decision making tools but you know, often well, I, I understand. You know, I think you know saying. what I'm saying, right? Uh, look, uh, if the biggest mistake I hate to say it is list, putting too much faith in your vendors. To, um, like, you know, in other words, um, if you're running a brokerage and you don't have a vision of that's it where you want to go with your brand and your your organization and how tech can enable that but you expect an outsider to come in and in the process of selling you something, tell you how to run your business because they have the tech and you don't, that's going to lead to some, you know, a lot of unmet promises. And I've seen that happen time and time again, especially with brokerage leadership that that is not necessarily tech literate or tends to think of it as something that belongs to another team. Um, it's, yeah, tech, uh, tech has to be holistic. It has to be everybody. Tech has to be holistic. Yeah. I think that if you, you know, tech is a tool, right? But it's not a silver, there is no silver bullet. And any, any vendor who claims to have one for, you know, predictive analytics or, you know, whatever, the paperless closing, you know, you right. name it. They generally don't work out. But if you, if you know, if you're a builder of a business and you talked about where people, tech and the built world combine, which I think is really cool. If you've built a business, then you probably know what your blueprint is. And tech can be a part of that blueprint, right. but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to throw out all the drawings and start over. And a lot right. of, I've seen that happen a bunch of times. Right, um, right. Well, so so looking at, at, the, at the tech world today for real estate brokerage, like if, if you were at a brokerage company today and, and, and you were handed the uh, responsibility of rethinking their tech stack. What, what, like, what are some things that you would start to look at? What are the questions that you would ask? Uh, well, I, you know, uh, an assessment is a good place to start. And I would, I would, I would try to determine whether there's a set of processes that work together, you know, across departments, you know, um, uh, like commissions people, and like, accounting. People, plus yeah. Marketing. From, from, all the way from listings to closings, or do we have, you know, or, or do you have islands of information, you know, where marketing does it one way, recruiting does it another, finance someplace else, and in the branch office, they've got a whole other thing going because nobody wanted to use the tech that the broker bought to begin with. Right, right. So it's adoption is a real challenge in large brokers, especially because. Uh, agents are independent contractors, mm-hmm. good agents and good teams often know exactly how they want to do things. And that often means using different tools than the broker is providing them with. And right. so then if you're the owner, you're like, well, why did I spend that money? You know, why am I spending 30 grand a month on this turnkey solution that we only have 15% adoption on? You, you did something, I, I forgot which company, it was something about a center of excellence that we talked about last time. Can you, uh, can you elaborate on that? Like well, what it was, where it came from? It was like a yeah, self-service you know, I've kind of reading, culture thing you did? Or, yeah. yeah, so, you know, um, uh, part of my CIO job was to, you know, sort of look ahead and figure out, you know, how things 
might be, even whether I can, you know, make them happen or not. And a few years ago, I started really learning a lot about um, digital transformation, uh, based in part on reading a book from uh, from some of the folks at Gartner. Actually, this is a really good book, Digital to the Core, Mark Raskind, and he talks about digital transformation in the enterprise and how if you get everybody from the boardroom, you know, to the back 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 office on board with your goal of becoming a digitally enabled organization, then you're going to be able to achieve things and compete much more effectively. And a lot of large organizations do this by establishing a center of excellence, COE, not close of escrow, COE, center of excellence. And the center of excellence is a is a center within the company where anyone can go and learn, you know, these digital best practices. It becomes the kind of the incubator within the company. Got it. And every successful large digital organization is doing this, but not hmm. in real estate. Oh, fascinating. So speaking about what's not happening in real estate, or maybe it is happening actually. I mean, there's a lot of great companies who do data, yeah. but like s- startups and tech companies are all about data. Uh, you know, understanding data, using data to make decisions, uh, you know, being KPI driven, KR driven, whatever, you know, model uh, that a, a, a tech or startup, you know, company is using. Uh, but it all comes down to data. Right. And, mm-hmm. and so how, how does how has data played a role in management decisions in your past? And like, what do you what, what have you seen in your travels? I know this is your core like in, in terms of applying data to the real estate business to make decisions mm-hmm. on recruiting, retention, et cetera? Yeah, great question. So I think, you know, in, in, in a lot of my roles, I've ended up working for the CFO. So, you know, what I, what I would see about, you know, how di- what data means in a traditional brokerage operation is it means spreadsheets and financial reports about, you know, profit and loss and commissions and, you know, and, and revenue and so on, which is all necessary to run a business. But, but what I have not seen, and and I believe is happening, but not at a very wide level, is the, you know, is brokers who understand that um, uh, using uh, best practices, using modern technologies mm-hmm. for data analytics and data visualization, can allow you to see and understand things better and more quickly than with traditional methods and speed is important if to respond to an agile, very quickly changing marketplace. I mean, just look at Amazon knows everything about their customers and that's because they pay attention to that information, that data. The and, tools are available to anyone in any industry to do this. And, and, and can you give an example? You know, the other day you gave one, so in case you forget, you know, like you gave a great one. Um, so I'll tee it up for you. You were talking about advertising, like marketing. And, yeah. and, and you know, can you give an example of how data can affect a broker's decision on their ad spend and, uh, sure. and more? I mean, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So a few years ago, I started working in uh, analytics and visualization um, to try to explore the fit between these technologies, you know, uh, and real estate. And, you know, part of it was, I just, I had dashboard envy, you know, every tech company had the coolest dashboards right. I'd ever seen. And I have a visual background. I was like, can't we get some of those in my firm? You know, yeah. and I realized I'd have to build them myself, but so, um, I built a number of proof of concept, you know, real estate dashboards initially to try and, uh, just answer a question. Um, uh, what's the relationship between my marketing spend and our sales activity? And can I, can I see this geographically uh, on a map Mm -hmm. uh, with several layers of visual information that will help me understand um, uh, which geographies have high levels of market activity, where are the sales happening and how does this map to what I'm spending on advertising? Because marketing spend is a big cost center in your Mm -hmm. traditional brokerage, whether it's online or offline. And, and yet and I to, don't see any intelligence in, in, in that process. It's like, well, did those ads work? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. And, and for those who are uh, watching us right now, so uh, I'm going to plug your website, which will have something on it soon. So it's, it's agentskinner.com, right? Yeah. 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 It's Ag- um, agentskinner.com. He'll be posting up some, some images today. But, but what he's talking about is visualizing data. 
right? It's not data in spreadsheets. Just imagine a map of California. And I'm sorry that I'm not sharing screen right now. I had an issue yesterday, the last time, as you know, I'm not going to mess around today. So, uh, uh, but, but, uh, you know, on, on agentskinner.com, you'll be able to see this. And, and basically it's visualizing this data, this information on a map versus on a spreadsheet which helps you really understand things a little bit better and you can spot trends better. Because it's one thing to see a list of cities and a list of prices, but then it's another thing to see how they relate to each other in a spatial way. And not to plug my own exactly. stuff, but that's also what Local Logic looks at uh, you know, yeah, for, build, for builders and for developers. It's the same kind of thing. It's using data in a, in a, in a visual way. Honestly, I mean, what you're doing at Local Logic is 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 one of the things that inspired me to do this kind of thing. Because over the years, I saw these great examples of, of how some real estate information companies were were doing this, you know, we're using visualization. Mm -hmm. They were using geospatial um, tools. That's just a fancy word for you know putting things on a map. Um, and and uh, and it always inspired me to want to try to incorporate that into some of the projects I was doing at my employer. And ultimately, you know, I, I've spent the last few years doing this outside of my you know, my brokerage world in the last, uh, you know, year or two, I've been doing this almost exclusively focusing on analytics and visualization. And it's been very rewarding to be honest with you, because it's not that it's, it's a challenge. It's, you know, to wrap your head around this and, and find that how does it fit with real estate, but the, um, uh, but the resources are all there. I mean, every yes. MLS listing has all the data you need to do amazing visual analytics. Is, is a broker, today ready to use data like like if you knocked on any broker's door today and said hey give me some data to do you know <laughs> let me show you what i can do are are they all ready for that or do they have to do something to prep for you to walk in well they're not all ready or i'd be like you know <laughs> i'd be running a big shop um but some are ready actually I, I mean i've spent all year knocking on doors during a pandemic you know which is like well this is a great time to start a consulting practice but you know i have a couple of um, skunk works projects that i'm doing uh, right now uh, for uh for a couple of leading uh, uh real estate companies and so you know there are visionaries at some brokers who realize like maybe we need to test the waters here and and learn how to use analytics and visualization to start to transform the way we operate because ultimately the long-term goal is to become a, a company where there's a culture uh, at all levels of self-service data enablement. And that means that anyone who has access to the appropriate information is empowered to ask questions and try to learn, have insights and share them with the rest of their team or their other teams. Yeah. This is how you avoid disruption. You use the same tools that the Redfins and the Zillows use and you empower your people to speak that language instead of saying, well, only, only the, uh, the financial analysts can, you know, can look at these numbers or whatever. Data totally. governance determines who gets to see what information, but data literacy and a data culture is where people are empowered at literally at all levels to, to be a part of this. It's yeah. actually a very cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, th there's a lot of co companies up approaching, data and data intelligence are, are there any you know out there that like catch your eye uh that if a broker is listening right now that they should go take a look at and it's okay if the answer is no you haven't seen anything and like it's like well i think there are a lot things. of very um you know technology is very fashionable in real estate and fashion trends change over time so there are some interesting companies that are doing things around um, using AI. Um, I think, uh, I don't know whether it's OHO or OJO, you know, labs, yeah. those guys yeah. um, totally. are doing interesting things. Um, I tend to shy away from the overly complicated solutions with too many bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a company which makes an amazing application uh, that's visually very stunning. I believe they're called Top Hat, and I don't want to tick anybody off, but I mean, I, I tend to think their application is way too complicated because most people mm. don't know how to work 
at that level. We're not Got flying it. a jet fighter all the time. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's some small, small organizations, you know, really in a niche area, like and OHO or OJO is an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot is happening around, you know, with the whole closing process. It's not that sexy, but um, yeah. getting figuring out how to close a listing and process a commission without a lot of paperwork is still a really important thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been seeing a, a lot of in interesting tech out there, um, and uh, yeah, no, it's really it, better it, than I do. It, it, it's 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 it, 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 it's a really exciting time in real estate tech, and I and I think like I like I said earlier, you know, the real estate industry is very very resilient. Uh, you know, everybody needs a home, right? It's it's the it's the base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, security, yeah. right? So so everybody needs a home. So even during COVID people are still seeking homes and they're leaving the city to find more security because they feel insecure in cities, right? So these are the things that are happening today. And this is the kind of data that brokerages need to know and how they can help their, their customer base, right? It's not about taking advantage of the market as much as it's about helping your customer base achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And if you have access to that data, it's it's excellent. I mean, clearly there's companies out there. I think like Real Scout has, has their- um, Real Scout's a great example. I yeah. should have mentioned them. Thank you. Yeah. And their biograph is, is yeah, a great example of something yeah. that brings, you know, the two things together, analytics and a fantastic customer solution, you yeah, know, and they've yeah. chosen to focus on a specific problem. The, the companies, tech companies that do that, I think tend to be more successful than the ones who try to be soup to nuts, 100%. especially for a broker. Yeah. 100%, 100%. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned real scout there. Ah, prob you probably know more than I do about <laughs> some of the players in this space, to be honest yeah. with you. Oh, I don't want to plug um, anybody. <laughs> I'll let that what know. I would say is that an important thing about this whole data journey for a, a technologist or you know, people listening or brokerage is it starts with um, with um, asking yourself questions. What is it that I want to know? You know, what what insight do I would I like to have that I don't have today? And then and then putting together you know tools and processes to to answer those questions. That's awesome, man. Well, well, folks, I think that was a great session. We learned a lot there. Uh, thank you so done? much. Yeah, we're done. We're good. Oh, I mean, we're good. I feel good. I feel like we hit all, all the great. points. Yeah, You're fun. Uh, um, I, 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 I want to make sure that, that folks know how to get in contact with you. So again, it's agentskinner.com. Um, he's doing consulting now for a lot of brokerage firms. So if you're looking for somebody to dig into your data, some of the projects I know you're working on are helping brokers identify, you know, it's the end of the year. You start looking at your recruiting lists, uh, you know, processing that data, creating some some targets there, uh, helping to understand where you know where the market's moving. And so, if you have any projects, have any questions involving data and 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 how to run your brokerage, or you're looking for a CTO, CIO, uh, Skinner is one of the one of the top in the space. Thanks, Peter. So, so nice that to that. Oh, always a yeah, pleasure. You, I'm on LinkedIn, Stephen with a PH. That's kind of all you need to know. Perfect. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the wrap up here. Give me a second. I think you're gonna be, uh, you know, you'll still be on the on the Zoom with me. So we'll wrap up. But I'll do the wrap up for everybody else. So uh, thank you everybody for your time. Um, the Groundbreaker series continues. Uh, I, I'm not gonna tell you who's gonna be on these these Groundbreakers. You have to watch our channel. So follow Local Logic, one of the top iBuyers buyers in the U.S. Uh, a hot startup that's bringing efficiency to transactions. We're gonna have a great talk on race and real estate with some awesome people that are gonna, that really have already blown my mind with some of the experiences and the things that they're doing to change the industry uh, to be more equitable to all parties. Uh, we're also gonna have a great session on startup journeys and more. So this is pretty much one a week for the next, you know, all time. So look for us on, uh, on uh, Facebook, on uh, LinkedIn, look for Local Logic. And I totally, totally thank everybody and thank you again. Uh, Skinner, you're back on the cam. Thank you again and see everybody next time. Follow us. Talk to you later. Bye, everybody. TGIF. Thanks, TGIF. Pierre. And happy Thanksgiving to my Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>